electricity for <laughs> 10 you hours.
Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today, uh, virtually. And we actually have some humans here uh, in the studio. So we're super psyched about that to talk about web today. And we hope everybody gets a lot out of it. Um, so welcome all you innovators and your thinkers and your dreamers. Um, on, as we kind of stand on the cusp of uh, 2024, going into 2024, the digital landscape is uh, evolving at unprecedented velocity. Um, today, we dissect some of these changes, not only to keep pace, but to kind of, you know, be a group of folks that uh, hopefully some of us are leading that change. Um, in the world of web, uh, basically the only constant is change. I've uh, been doing web here since the beginning of web. Um, but this year, we're not just observing, you know, shifts. We're actually witnessing a very strong revolution um, within web itself. Uh, artificial intelligence is moving uh, from a support act to a lead role, uh, shaping content that's not only personalized but prescient. Um, interactivity and immersive experiences are setting kind of new standards. Uh, the boundary between user and interface is blurring a little bit uh, with accessibility and user-centric design taking center stage, ensuring that web is inclusive, uh, an inclusive domain for all. Uh, sustainability is another huge topic um, with ethics and digital design. It's no longer optional, um, it's imperative. Uh, our carbon footprint of uh, the digital creations and ethical implications are under scrutiny, pushing us towards more responsibility and web practices, which at the end of the day is probably a good thing. Um, we're also joined by a folks uh, today on our panel. I want to make sure I get to the right places here. Um, Shana Silverman, who is our COO here at Over It. Shana has worked with our dev team for about a decade and leads the Over It team by providing guidance and strategy on processes and procedures for all of our web uh, efforts. So thank you, Shana. Um, Merrick. Jancour, I said it correctly. Jancour, you almost got it. Yes, almost. Uh, Merrick is a seasoned UI UX designer with a rich background in visual design. Over 20 years of experience uh, and a BFA from Pratt. Uh, Merrick is known for his innovative approach uh, to design. He specializes in creating uh, amazing digital experiences uh, beyond the screen. Um, so, Mirik, thank you for joining us today, and um, we're all looking forward to uh, some information um, from you. Uh, let me make sure I got my stuff in order. And Dan O'Leary. Yeah, Dan O'Leary. <laughs> we can never forget Dan O'Leary. Uh, Dan is a senior analyst in SEO here at Over It. Uh, over the course of his career, Dan has worked with hundreds of clients in every, practically every vertical I could imagine, uh, from enterprise level Fortune 500 to family owned small businesses and a wide range of nonprofit organizations and governmental agencies. Um, so, as we kind of delve into today's discussion, um, let's challenge ourselves to kind of think beyond the current trends. Let's envision a web that's not only connecting and informing, but also elevates and inspires us. Uh, the future of the web is not just about what we can build, it's about what we should build. Um, and we are very excited about talking about some of those items. Uh, before we delve deeper into the panel, I just wanted to anchor our discussion in some tangible things. Um, some web technologies that we should kind of be on the lookout for that are shaping our digital experiences uh, AI-driven personalization. Uh, I'm trying to catch up to the slides. I'm going blind. Yeah, AI digital present uh, presentations uh, is you know web experiences that are adapting in kind of real time to uh, people's strategies and their user behavior and their preferences. Uh, sustainable web design with digital sustainability becoming a global imperative, eco-friendly and web practices are in need. Um, immersive experiences, uh, we kind of are seeing like new technologies, new wearables, those types of things, but AR and VR are literally uh, taking uh, front and center into how people are uh, 
utilizing the digital landscape. Uh, we also are moving into a lot of like voice activated things, so voice user interfaces. Um, voice activated device are growing. Uh, voice user interfaces are becoming a vital component for web design, making digital content more accessible and providing a seamless user experience. Um, we're seeing a lot with like micro interactions and motion UI. Uh, so if you think about like small animations, uh, interactive elements, micro interactions, they're kind of really enriching user experiences and bringing web pages to life, capturing attention and guiding people through content. Um, ethical and uh, inclusive design. Uh, inclusivity is forefront. Uh, with a strong emphasis on ethical design principles, this means creating web spaces that are accessible to all, uh, respecting user privacy and fostering a sense of community. Uh, there's also, uh, we see a decentralization um, and Web3 with blockchains and Web3 technologies is decentralizing the web, offering new opportunities for privacy, uh, new opportunities for ownership and user empowerment. Uh, this is kind of a bit redefining how we are thinking about uh, our digital spaces. Uh, video, we're seeing a tremendous amount of video um, pushing boundaries and enhancing user experience, AI-driven video personalization, uh, immersive experiences, AR and VR. Um, these are all things that are no longer uh, passive. Interactive features are kind of turning viewers into participants and kind of enriching a user journey. And then uh, SEO, which we'll get into some uh, in depth a little bit, but content depth, technical finesse, uh, user first optimization, SEO is evolving beyond keywords to understand the actual user's intent, making content relevant and paramount uh, with what's going on. So that said, again, thank you for everybody for joining. We hope we can provide you some valuable information today. Um, and we will start with some questions and then we're happy to take some questions and have a Q&A as well. So that said, um, what place does your website have in the overall digital marketing space? How has it changed over the past few years? Uh, and we'll start with Shana uh, speaking to that a little bit. All right. Well, um, it's definitely your digital hub. So you want it, it's where you can engage most directly with your, your customers. Um, it is where you educate and, um, and, uh, and present your brand experience. Uh, so what is your messaging? Um, how, what, what are your goals? Uh, it's, it's a place where you can personalize content for people. Um, Essentially, it is your it is your hub, right? Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen a lot of uh, web experiences move into specific micro journeys for a pathway. Um, so, really working much deeper into the use UX of the site um, and how we're trying to accomplish. You know, businesses have expanded; they have multiple objectives. Um, so really focusing on how do you create a very seamless user experience. Um, you know, it's no longer uh, just the brochure type thing. We're trying to, you know, find objectives uh, for either businesses or organizations that are providing very personalized content uh, in a very uh, simplistic and easy to use way. So it does. It starts with Merrick, right? And it starts mm -hmm. with research and, and the team. Right. And, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there will be a question eventually, right? But, yeah, right. That's, that's, right. But right. That's Understanding the, personas. The user experience is definitely uh, the the very base, basis of any, any web development and yeah. redesign or, or creating a brand new project. So without that, um, I don't think you can design a website. We don't know where to go. <laughs> right, without knowing what the user wants. That's right. Mm -hmm. And we do have, we see a lot of websites with that uh, have like different service lines, kind of like what we were talking about, like, you know, different service lines, different product offerings, different audiences even uh, that they're trying to reach. And we see that everywhere from like education and healthcare and service-based companies. Um, that they need to create those. So how, how have you guys kind of seen that change over the years on how we approach that? 
But I think, I mean, you always do research, but I think there there's more research and more um, mapping out of, of what are the goals? How are we getting people there? How are we providing for the different types of users? They're the self-directed user or the, the user that wants to be led down a path, right? We have to create the paths for everybody. Uh, we have to understand where they're going and what their goals are and how to deliver up what they're looking for as quickly and efficiently as possible. So so that's a lot of the, the prep work that we're doing to understand that. I would also add maybe the, the omni-channel of the whole experience. Uh, knowing all the different paths, pathways that the user can get to that particular goal that we want them to get to, and making sure that they all together all these all these touch points, um, so the user can you know so we can give them the best experience. I, I think that's the biggest thing I've noticed, uh, and also the dynamic content that will follow that you know uh, the personalized content that will basically follows you around as you're uh, browsing or experiencing going to places. I've seen a lot of different examples all the way for, to the dig digital uh, billboards to email marketing. It's all connected, you know, you just have to uh, connect all of these uh, touch points together. And then things like the Netflix, user. where they're like actually learning more about you mm -hmm. uh, and presenting you with more content that you'd like. Um, and then, and then we measure, right? So we've we've done a lot of research. We've built this, and then we have to examine how well it's working and how well people are interacting with it. So where are people falling off? Where are people having struggles? And how do we fix that? So it's not a okay. We did all this. We created this. Here it is, right? We have to continually work on it and evolve it. Yeah, I mean, we've kind of <clears throat> evolved over the years. Where you know you have like maps of websites, um, but. You know, now delving into that user journey and developing, you know, visual workflows for how user journeys work and how that's going to be mapped out. Um, it's very interesting. So, uh, Mirik, since this is like one of the areas of your expertise, research journey uh, informing, um, what more would you add to that? And before, can, sorry. Yeah, but so I, I, Dan I can, is a big part of this too, so mm -hmm. just tie him back into it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's there is a slide here. I guess we could start about the whole idea of of what UX is and what UI is, and this is the slide that keeps coming up a lot. You know, if you browsing LinkedIn, this would pop a lot, and I just want to say this is not accurate. <laughs> uh, so basically, you know what this is a meme and. Uh, it's, it's in my opinion, and I've actually did research about this a little bit too, which the UX comes in, <laughs> uh, the whole picture is UX, you know, like there, the path the user took, the brand new path, uh, just shows that, you know, the possibilities, you know, but there was the architects, they did, did take the time to figure out all these crossways and, I mean, we don't know. We don't know the whole picture will happen here. So that's why I'm saying, you know, don't look at these things and in the memes that the, when they separate design from user experience in that way, because they all work together. You know, so that's the biggest thing about uh, web design and having the researchers and having us working together because it's in the end, and you know, user experience takes everything under in this big um, umbrella which the next slide will can we uh, pause for one yeah, second yeah. though and just say so when we're rebuilding a website right a lot dan does a lot of research as well and helps inform this from how are people using the current website and i'll let you talk about that yeah like one of the key components of keyword research and, and i like to think of keyword research as an seo is like it's just a part of what we would call like persona development right like you're doing focus groups you're doing interviews you're doing um all the sorts of um, bits of research that sort of come together but the search engine component of it is like during these user journeys like what do people put into google right and typically they're putting in um you know i would the acronym a lot of seos use or not acronym but uh, expression is go see or do like users want to go someplace 
um, they want to see or learn something, or they want to take some discrete specific like action. They want to sign up for something. They want to add something to a card and purchase it. They want to um, give you your email or phone number and, and have them contact you. Whatever it might be, whatever the goals for your website are, before they get to your website, they're already kind of sharing those goals, right? User intent, we would call it, um, with Google. So my job is to make sure just like me and Merrick are like on the same page in that regard. Like we both have a common understanding of like what the objectives of the website are, what are the actions or outcomes that we're trying to like foster through the website um, and making sure that obviously like, all right, I know like what a user wants to do, but like, how do they do it? And that's like where Merrick and I like comes in because it's now gonna be like informed by design, but we're not just coming up with things that we think are neat. Like it's obviously like heavily informed by like data, keyword research, trend reports, things like that. Um, all of it comes into uh, the fold and that's kind of like where the, the SEO component I would say brings it full circle. I think it's interesting. Often, you know, the client comes to us and says, okay, here are our goals, here are our personas, and Dan and Merrick do research and, and find you have a tremendous amount of people um, doing doing something that wasn't one of your goals, spending this time on your on your website. And is this an important audience to continue to nurture? Uh, what's the value there and what, what do we do with them? Uh, right. So I, I think that's always mm -hmm. interesting because we find that a lot. Yeah, I find that often working with a lot of like nonprofits and organizations. Mm -hmm. Like there's these like micro audiences, I guess is the best way to describe them. They're like, they're not like when you kind of do persona development, you 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 you, you give them names, right? And you give them titles. It's like it's Kathy and she's the CEO. And then there's Linda and she's the donor, right? But we and we kind of box them in. And even when you're trying to do something as like robust and like organic as a persona, you're still sort of putting it in boxes. And sometimes the keyword research gives you like the the cracks between the boxes. In those cracks are like other people, other audiences, other intents that still align with whatever that organization is like trying to do but they don't necessarily have like content that speaks to them or they need maybe like you were saying, some people are self-directed, other people like definitely need like their hand held a little bit and kind of nudged in like the right direction. So those are other things that keyword research can do, can sort of like even just working with people in that organization, give them a completely fresh outside pair of eyes. Like I'm not part of your organization, so I don't have any of that culture thing yet. Um, and I'm just looking at data. I'm just looking at what people type into Google when no one's around. It's like a confessional, right? So <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> um, that's one way I like to think of it too, like that, that you can learn stuff from um, keyword research that you're not going to get from a focus group or an interview because like people don't tell live people things that they might like type into like Google when they're searching, right? So there's a sort of like privacy or anonymity factor and you kind of really can get to like distilled truths that you maybe wouldn't be able to get like elsewhere. And again, it's kind of like, mm -hmm. now we bring that back to Merrick and we bring it back to the content writers and like we have to work together holistically to sort of figure out like how do we again foster these actions or outcomes that the, um, the audiences are trying to, to accomplish. And one more thing here. So going from what we learned there and search in Google Google to how people search the websites and how important search is or is not depending on what your goals of the website are and and how robust these this particular feature can be in in um, predictive search or uh, search that is that that you know the, we have a lot of control over what the results are refining the search um, anticipating search uh, c controlling what content is available through search. So there are lots of different ways we can manipulate that as well. And I think that's a really important piece in the user journey and how important the search mm -hmm. piece is. So with thinking about the user journey, like Dan, you've been doing this a long time. Um, and we have seen like that personalization and these businesses offering different segments, different lines, different you know personas that they're trying to communicate with, with uh, their audience. From your perspective, how has that kind of changed from the SEO? Like when you're when you're looking at a site and you're trying to connect all these different audiences in this journey, how is how has that affected what you do? Like what has changed? I would say the most significant change in SEO has probably been like the the shift away from optimizing for just keywords, like words on a page, versus like again, like I use the phrase user intent, like what are they trying to, to do? It's very, I would say, easy 
to like optimize a website for just like words, right? These are what the people type in. Like, let me just parrot that back and put those words back onto the page. And right, the good old days. Yeah, the good old <laughs> days of SEO. And we all, we, you still see many sites like this. Like you, you can tell when a site has been like written and like uh, sort of like, again, I would say optimized for search engines above like users. It reads and feels in a very um, sort of clunky way. The keywords just jump off the page because that's the intent to keep spamming the page with like lots of keywords. And like it kind of maybe answers your question or meets like your informational needs, but like not in a satisfactory way, not in a way that like speaks to anybody's like genuine brand or voice or again, like true north if you're an organization or a nonprofit. Um, so keywords still matter. And like, I'll talk a little bit about keywords like later, but like, it, it, it's not about the keywords anymore. It's really, again, about like what's behind the keywords. What are the psychological and motivating factors that are, um, you know, driving the search to begin with, um, and, em embracing that. I mean, SEO still in 2024 have a reputation as being like ruthless spammers who will do anything it takes <laughs> to get to like number one in Google. And sometimes you've got to like do SEO heavy tactics, right? I think even Google themselves, there's been a lot of updates recently. Um, the helpful content update, the, the, the emphasis Google put was helpful content, right? Um, they put it right in the update. So a lot of sites kind of got dinged because they were essentially, you know, becoming more like content spam farms than like actually serving like users, right? So every time kind of Google uses the carrot and stick approach, well, we recently had like a stick episode where like a bunch of sites lost rankings due to it. And I think, you know, from, from the SEO perspective, it's like, well, what's the, what's the takeaway? Um, many SEOs still haven't changed their tune, but the smarter ones will realize like the, the takeaway is to embrace UX. The takeaway is to embrace like other aspects of marketing that aren't about keywords, right? They're about the, the whole user journey. And just again, using SEO as like one lens, one, one way to kind of look at the data and like inform the design, but not like take over the website and take over the copy and take over like the entire thing because you're beholden to Google more than you're beholden to your own users, right? The second you start doing that, when you make those like trade-offs, your conversion rates are, are gonna like, I feel impacted. And Google is like stressed, I can't emphasize this enough. If you go to Google's documentation, they're like, what are we looking for? for our search engines rankings. Like what do we want to even put in our rankings? They want to put good content. They want to put stuff that people actually want to read and click on and engage with. They don't want stuff that's been manipulated for like them themselves, right? Now it's really hard because you obviously like, you know, it's just like you can't write it and it's instantly going to rank in Google. You do need people who know SEO to like help but it can get taken, I would say, too far. And I would say the last couple of years, it's been a big swing back in the pendulum, I think, in the SEO community of going back to like, just go back to marketing 101, go back to just like psychology and users and get really focused on that. And if you can do that well, and we'll talk about accessibility in a little bit as well. If you can do good UX, good design, and like good accessibility, I've hardly ever seen a site that did both of those things well and didn't also like rank pretty well. Right. Like it's hard to like do good accessibility, good UX and like somehow have this like magical gap of like, but our SEO stinks. I've never seen that. So I feel like it's just a natural dovetail result of like if you do these other two things, like that's just a that's it's a, that's a natural outcome of that process rather than like putting the cart before the horse. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like with all, you know, and people are engaging in very different ways from an SEO perspective from a brand perspective. So um, Merrick, since working in, in, in the design side and, and the engagement side, um, how are people, are you seeing changes, uh, forward momentum? How are things changing on how people are engaging with websites? Well, like I mentioned before, the, the, um, the whole idea of dynamic content is very important. The personalization that that has changed, evolved, and uh, I really like where it's going. Where you know, each time I would go on a very specific website, you would like craft the specific way for me. There are uh, some examples out there, uh, like Apple would do that, um, but the other things that you know, the typical stuff uh, that will 
always remains uh, that I've noticed that it's mostly as long as you have the social following uh, influencers that these are the type of stuff that uh, has arrived on the scene but other things like content article videos uh, uh, subscriptions any of those things that uh, you is visible on the website is very important to keep the engagement going um, I think uh, from working one of the uh, silos for pest control, for example, we noticed that giveaways are very important too to keep the engagement going. So from giveaways to freebies to downloadables and uh, any type of stuff like that, coupons, you know, it all counts for engagement, um, retainment and conversions. Um, I think the uh, let's see anything else. A new thing that I noticed was the for engagement, at least for my uh, uh, for my benefit. I, I like actually getting those if I land on a specific website that I like. Is the push not notifications? They appear on the bars on the left upper right uh, upper right side of the uh, of the search bar of the uh, domain. And I like to use, usually engage with those, so I the website will follow me, and I will get some sort of a feedback in the future, so I don't forget about those websites. Those these are the new things that I noticed that I actually like. You know, other things like pop-ups. You know, I'm not really into those. You know, to engage with me, uh, depending on the business, I guess. You know. Um, and how about a basic question? Like, what's mm -hmm. the difference between UI and UX? Um. Uh, now we're right. going back to the UX, yes. Well, yeah, so, well, let's talk, yeah, let's talk a little bit about mm -hmm. like, de just defining that. Yeah, so um, it's you, uh, so basically this slide is something that I actually like uh, because it shows you what really happens here, you know, the, the massive work that's being done behind, uh, behind the wall that you can really see, which in this case underwater, this is the UX, the research that, that's being put in to, to, to really start the process. Um, and above that, uh, you have the UI, but they all part of the same unit, you know, they all inform each other. And, and so if you go to the next slide, I think the definition will start here. Dan uh, Norman is the originator of the statement. He's ha he runs a really great website um, just about users. So if you guys ever want to look up Dan Norman, um, you'll find his uh, website. It's all about usability and all the best practices. Uh, so UX encompasses all aspects of end users' interactions with company, its services, and products. So these are all the things that all user centric type of a thinking uh, as opposed to UI. If you go to the next slide, it's just about visual touch points uh, or assets that user interacts with. So it's the look and feel interactivity uh, of the of the product uh, and basic cosmetics of the experience. So that's the main the main difference. If you really want to separate these two into to like understandable blocks. And then you were talking about trends and for a while, right? Yeah, like, but before I even get there, yeah. you know, the whole idea of how they overlap is 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 presented here that they actually work as a unit. Yeah. So you have the product strategy, user research, information architecture, CEO, all that, you know, testing iteration on one side. On the other side, you have the color, typography, and all the other touch points that UI would do, including digital style guides and stuff like that. But they all meet in the middle with collaboration, prototyping, and design thinking. And one of those things is uh, UCD, which is the short for user-centric design. So it's a process that we incorporate that uh, it's a method of user experience that we have specific steps that we follow, but we always return to them to make sure that everything tests the way we want it to test. So if something doesn't work, we have the ability to return, redo it, and continue in that um, revolving fashion for user-centric design idea. And actually, this is my favorite mag I have here, uh, experiment fell 
learn, repeat. This is my uh, type of a mantra that I use for UCD thinking. Uh, never give up, always find on the way, but make sure the user is involved at all steps uh, of the process. And, you know, as many team members as you can get involved in the, in the process of user. That's right, more brains are better yeah. than one. And you did have some examples here. Yeah, these, these are just smaller examples of as very basic, uh, you know, I actually sketched this out myself, but, you know, it just shows you visually what personas are, then uh, really describe them really well before. Uh, but, you know, we have all of these, it's, it's smaller bits about the user that we researched, you know, and we combine them into this little card that allows us to, to release the big picture um, of what the type of uh, audience uh, could be. And what their needs are, and what their what their behaviors are, and how they feel about things, and what is the personal um, belief about a given idea. Um, in the middle, you have uh, something that we talked about a lot here. It's a quick sketch of what user journey really could look like. So you have these uh, blocks, and we just follow a path and on each each of these paths we we would highlight a touch point you know, of the engagement of the user so that's that's what this really means and then you know like the stuff that i really do a lot is the wireframing and in this case is a low low fidelity wireframing so it's basically sketching so a lot of iterations of that happens before i can actually move on to uh prototyping just to make sure that everything is in place. And I would go back with, again, using the UCD model to make sure that all the information and the content was, is accountable from, from, the, from the CEO perspective and the content writers and digital marketing. So wireframes really help to, to start the process. Um, and in this case, you know, you have, I usually do, uh, I would do, desktop and mobile sometimes when the, we have the largest scale clients we would include other uh, other devices as well but for most part it's a really quick sketch iteration and sometimes we are asked to do uh, hi-fi wires which are grayscale they actually in the prototype that we uh, we would utilize further down the road but um, they basically reflect specific functionality that we need to discover mostly it would be filtering or like search functionalities that are more complicated yeah or like that the we realized that's web right. app that we right. did for the ski mountains so right? something these are, like that these are the methods that i would you know we would mostly use to to get to these and there's many many more um uh, research methods of, yeah. of the ux and the, these are the lists of some of those so these are split into discover, testing, exploration, and uh, listening. So requirements, user inter interviews, these are that's the discover, discovery phase. That's where we would conduct audits, you know, and re researches with uh, interviews with, uh, with, with the users. And we actually have a room in the back that we sometimes utilize uh, to for, for this type of purpose. <laughs> Um, then, you know, the exploration that we already, we already talked about, the uh, journey maps and user flows are really big too. They help us to achieve those goals quicker. Um, so the typical, when the user jumps on a website, we want them to get to the goal as, as fast as we can. We also do want to engage them. So there's different types of thinking. If you want to engage the uh, the user, then we craft that experience on the on the landing page or the home page. But if there if there is a way to get them to that specific goal, if they don't have time to waste on the website, we need to make sure that the navigation is easy to use and and the uh, call to actions are clear and uh, there's as least as possible steps to get there so they can get to the goal. Um, and then listening, surveys, uh, analysis, A-B testing, all of those things are very important. And we mentioned accessibility as well. 
uh, these these accessibility things are very important these days. <laughs> uh, we seeing uh, law firms following different websites these days to make sure that they're accessible. Uh, different states have different rules, um, but uh, that's something that we trying to implement uh, with color, with typography, with uh, contrast. So, and how we name uh, all of the imagery, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, for for impaired people that cannot uh, see or something, there will be description on the image what that image is. So there's a lot of small small layers of those of those things that it's all part of that research method. Yeah, um, even on a small scale, from an ADA standpoint, um, we've seen a lot of just you know it's it's important for every website that's kind of going up to be looking at you know some level of ADA compliancy. Um, that's definitely changed over the years. And also kind of what Mirik was saying about the discovery piece, um, you know, being able to start your website and get into the website development really needs that your brand and your messaging has to be extremely tight and understandable and clear. And even to get to a, a, a very valid discovery phase for building out the site, um, you know, a lot of companies have come and that's just not really been facilitated yet where that clarity around the brand and the brand messaging is not completely uh, under wraps. If that, if you come with a very strong brand messaging, brand uh, guidelines uh, going into web development, it's definitely helpful for those requirements that are needed for the website as you move forward um, and building. So um, yeah, Dan, Talking, and I know we love to talk SEO, um, but SEO concerns for designing or rebuilding a website. Can you kind of talk a little bit about, because we, we get hit every day practically of either a rebuild, we're building a new site, we're moving domains. What are the steps and pieces that are most critical to people when they're looking at doing so, such a thing? Yeah, that's a good question. So at a high level, I would say like SEO, you could kind of think of it as like it having three equally important pillars or cornerstones. Um, you have like technical SEO, which we're going to talk about in like one second. That'll be like kind of the main thing, web developers and web development where that'll tie in. There is some on-page SEO stuff that definitely matters. And we've kind of already talked about like keywords and user intent and that kind of speaks to the on-page stuff. There is off-page SEO that is like a big area and focus of SEO, backlinks and the sites that link to you and how they're linking to you, where they're linking to. We're not going to get into that, so we'll just even go to the next slide now, like get rid of that pillar, right? The two ones I would say from a web development standpoint that actually matter for like an SEO would be like your technical SEO and then like your on-page stuff. And the on-page stuff is also more, this is where you need to like work with like copywriters or like your marketing team. Like it's not the web developers like responsibility to like get the content up on the site. Um, they, they will physically load it, but they're not going to like write it. Um, so like, let's talk about some of the technical SEO stuff. So you've got but URL discovery, crawling and indexation, you want to like um, Google and other search engines are going to physically like render your page as a browser would these days. They used to kind of do it as a bot. Now they do it exactly as like what they call a headless browser. So they're loading it exactly as a user would see it and they're measuring like load times and responsivity, right? The core web vitals that you might have heard about. Those things are all going to matter. Um, and then you've got SEO specific markup, which I can like give a few examples of that are going to like really matter that you make sure that you're using those tags or attributes in there. And then you've got some on-page stuff like content optimization and how you organize your content. And again, there's kind of like some markup that, that helps your SEO. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so for technical SEO, like the main things you want to do is like Google has to find your pages. So you got to get them found. Google has to crawl them, so you need these pages crawled and indexed, and then they need to get like ranked according to some like search engine um, algorithm, right? That the ranking mm -hmm. factors. So the first part of that is like, how does Google even find pages on your website? So we call that URL discovery. Um, there's a variety of ways they do it. One, they kind of just will like um, follow links from other websites and find your website and then just start crawling every link that's on your website. 
So this is like where your menus and your internal linking structures first and foremost can foster this process. If you have a very boxed in website where just like every page is an island unto itself and they're not linking and you don't have good like menus or sub menu structures, it might be a little bit like harder for Google to like follow like th th the link structure to fully crawl the site. But one thing you have your advantage is like an XML sitemap. So that's one thing I would definitely say is like a must if you're launching a website, definitely take advantage of XML sitemaps because it's basically just like a directory of all the pages Pages that you want um, indexed by a search engine. If you do not want it indexed by a search engine, do not submit it through your XML sitemaps. And there are certain times, certain pages, you might have um, privacy stuff, right? Maybe you're working in healthcare or financial. Maybe it's like a paid subscription site and that yeah, content's behind the paywall, content, yeah. right? Gated content. So there might be stuff that you definitely don't want indexed by search engines, but if you're trying to attract new users or visitors and you want that to be ranked by Google, you're going to put it in your XML sitemap. And they have sitemaps for URLs, just traditional pages. If you're heavily using video, you could submit your video URLs as a separate type of sitemap unto itself. Images can get their own sitemaps. Any sort of attachments or files that you might have on your, on your site, all of them can get their own XML sitemaps. So definitely use those because they're gonna like help Google um, find all the pages that you want ranked and they're gonna crawl them. And again, your site architecture and your internal linking structures can help that. Um, then indexation. So we build sites here in like what we call a dev environment. It's like a sandbox that's like quarantined away from everything else. Google can't see it yet. When we're doing that, we use a specific markup called no index. And that basically means if a search engine were to accidentally find it, you're telling it specifically this is not ready to be indexed yet. So you're using no index or what's sometimes called no follow, no index, no follow. They're often like grouped together. Um, when you're ready to push that site out live, you have to take that no index off and now you're going to replace it with its opposite, index follow, meaning you want Google to follow all the links to pages on your site and you want to index all of them, all right? This is a very common, um, when stuff goes live sometimes and there's like an uh-oh moment, one of the most common things we often see is just like someone forgot to take off the no index. And that's why Google like can't see it or rank it because it got pushed out live exactly like the way it was in dev. So that's just one of those like last second quality control checks, like has the no index been removed and can we like push that out live? But um, you're gonna be able to control when and where you want indexation to happen using that. And then there's some really cool technologies these days, um, like the Index Now protocol. This is something that was developed by Bing and Yandex, and then Google got on board with it recently too. So um, pretty much three of the world's biggest search engines already like using this. This is um, interesting. An XML sitemap is basically you have a static file, and Google comes and finds it, and they like this is called like the pull method. They're pulling URLs and they're like, okay, I'm gonna go maybe and crawl these. But then you have what's called like crawl budgets. How many pages is Google gonna crawl at any given time? And if you're not giving them explicit commands, they're basically just gonna go to the same sitemaps and crawl the same pages in like the same order, generally. Um, the index now protocol, this is something you can put into your website. You need an API token that you put into your head, um, sort of just like with like Google Tag Manager or an analytics script, right? It's something you kind of put into the head, not the body of the page. And this is a push method. Anytime the content management system detects that a new page has been created or even updated, like you could update like a paragraph. And then when it senses that, it pushes, it tells to the participating search engines, this specific page has changed and please reflect this change. So you can now get like what's called like almost instant indexation, right? As soon as you have a new page, you don't have to wait a day, a week, a month, whatever your crawl budget permits to get that new page of content published. You can like push only the pages that are newer that are being updated and not like wasting your crawl budget on pages that don't change regularly. So if you're a publisher, if you do a lot of blogging, right, if you're a content factory, this is going to be something definitely I would take advantage of. If you're on WordPress, we're big fans of WordPress here, there's no shortage of plugins for it. Um, you can Google index now. It's a standard open source protocol. The documentation and the APIs are all there for uh, anyone to use. And I definitely recommend like using that. 
Um, Google Search Console, that's definitely your best friend for like monitoring how many pages Google is crawling and indexing and like which pages. They even now have a report that tells you, here are pages we have crawled, but we have not indexed. And that basically means these days, Google's almost getting to a point where there's like too much content on the web and they have to choose what they actually want to like index now. Like you can't just have a web page. It has to have some sort of value to a user or even Google's eyes. So it's kind of raising that content bar like a little bit, um, but it's based out of purely um, technical and financial concerns because Google, you know, they have all the servers in the world, but there are still only so many servers in the world, right? So they have to cap now how many pages are willing to actually like index. And they'll give you a report that says like, we've found these URLs, but we did not deem them to be like indexable. They don't really tell you why, but if you go and look at that report and really put your head together and like be honest with yourself, you'll often and find very common reasons why. Oh, that's all duplicate content, or it's all thin content, or there's not really, um, there's a lot of maybe like a whole bunch of like intrusive ads and pop-ups flying all over the pages, right? There might be some very clear reason why Google hasn't deemed like that they want to like include it yet. So Google Search Console is definitely going to be something to take advantage of to see those um, crawling and indexation signals and the data that Google's giving back to you. And then I guess I would say the last one is like core web vitals, like your page rendering. Google is prioritizing um, three things these days, speed, interactivity, responsiveness, and visual stability. Those are like the three core things. So like the, the site has to like load fast. The metric they use is largest content paint, meaning the most biggest visible thing on the page that people when they see the page like not loading and not loading, they get frustrated and they abandon. Even if you can't fully load all of the page, Whatever is the biggest on the site, and this is where user studies have like come in and shown and demonstrated this, people will stick around if they can get some semblance or indication that the page is starting to assemble, that it's actually rendering in the browser. And the largest content paint, the thing that's biggest and most visible above the fold, tends to be the things that people like latch onto. So they score you on that. Um, obviously, like image compression, um, Ma handling and managing your JavaScript, because a lot of stuff these days in web development is backed by JavaScript, um, and JavaScript can increase your payload size as you're trying to deliver it through networks. So be mindful of those things. Um, in terms of the interactivity, that is like if I'm clicking on a field and I'm entering a form, if there's like any sort of like lag, like in that interactivity, or if you're clicking a video button and you're pausing it, right? Any sort of like lag that goes above I would say like 100 milliseconds starts to become noticeable by like the human um, nervous system in the, in the eye. So this is again where the user studies show that people get frustrated. They start calling your site laggy or janky, right? Whatever it might be. That interactivity responsiveness, how quick and agile is it, is something you're being evaluated on. And then visual stability is basically like as the page loads, sometimes every once in a while at the last second, like a new image or a new part of the site loads and it rearranges the entire rest of the site. So maybe a user was about to go click on like a call to action, but then the call to action like moved at the last second and they like clicked on something else or what they're clicking on isn't clickable anymore. It, it's like it skips almost. It's kind of like if you know, if you think of music like how a CD to use to skip. This is visual skipping. Um, visual stability and predictability of if I'm moving my mouse cursor and I'm going to take an action that I can predict and know that it's going to be there in 100 milliseconds is very critical to like the user. So those are the three things that are being measured that kind of give you like a good, better, I'm sorry, good, okay, and then like poor, like needs definite like clear improvement. Um, and then sites that pass all of those get like good core web vitals. And Google has basically come out and said like, look, this is not the most important ranking factor. We don't want you to like obsess over this, but like this is a ranking factor that is in play live during a ranking system. It is important. And I think we can use that to talk a little bit about um, the framework that you're building your website on. Mm -hmm. um, so, right. Get, given that, um, you know, budget is always a constraint, but the way that we approach websites is, is building custom themes, because when you buy an out of the box theme or framework, uh, you're getting a lot of extra bloated code on top of it. And yes. a lot of things have to load into the website when um, it's unnecessary. It's not, it, it's not needed for the page load. So the more streamlined and cleaner the code is, um, the better your your, your web vitals will be, but uh, and the better the overall performance of the website is. So you want to make sure that we have a little bit of time to talk about that and answer questions. I know we're well, close like to the WYSIWYG questions. stuff, like, you know, 
there's, like, there's a lot of like platforms out there. Like Squarespace Wix, and Wix. All these and, types of things. You know, like, or or, th- or Shopify. Shopify. Like but are there yeah. things there that we should that people should be looking out to? Like what are the cons? You know, when you're looking at those types of things, I think we get asked that question like, hey, the, we built the, this. Uh, the cons space. are the code bloat, in my opinion. Like when you have something that's designed for inherent modularity, right? It's designed to work with almost anything you could throw at it. It's drag and drop. I can like move things around. If you were creating like a physical interface that had to connect to every possible USB core that ever existed on the planet, right? It would be this needlessly complex thing that would have like a lot of ports and holes. And maybe at any given time, you're only using one of them, but you had to design it to accept like all of them, right? As a user, you don't see all the HTML, all the CSS, all the JavaScript that gets like loaded onto a thing. So the ease is like definitely like, you know, you don't have to hand code everything, yeah, right? You can wrong. use existing libraries, right. but there's the, there, it's a balance. And this is where I find it's like, it's equally art than science, right? Yeah. You have to use your discretion as to like what battles are worth fighting, where do I need an out of the box plug and play solution? Or maybe do I just need to roll up my sleeves and like code a little bit more? Because I can get leaner, faster performance out of doing it by hand versus this is a needlessly, um, uh, not needlessly, this is a complex process or need. It's not our wheelhouse. We have no experience with it at this point. Maybe now we want to consider something that has been developed in an open source community, been tested by others, right? So it's got that sort of tried and true, you know the code will work because it's been implemented and reviewed by everyone else who's using it. That's like, again, why we're big proponents of using like open source platforms like WordPress. It's because it's community driven, like, right? If you want an alternative, there's almost always another one that does the same sort of thing, right? Prices matter, obviously, um, contracts, if these are paid plugins and performance, but um, you know, every time you use one of those, you are sacrificing a little bit of your sheer speed optimization but you also speed up development time. Right? So when we're looking, so like you mentioned pricing and, we, you know, on my end, you know, we talk to clients all the time and some have, you know, can follow all these processes the way we just love to do a website. Um, but there is lots of businesses out there that, um, you know, they just don't have unlimited budgets. So if there is a place that, you know, out of these steps of processes that we've kind of talked about, what what areas could, should we absolutely or should people absolutely uh, not cut out of that process? I mean, you want to do a little, you want to understand your goals and take the time to set your website up to uh, to reach your goals. I mean, that that's really important. As far as the framework that you're building on, you know, th- there's compromise. There's compromise in anything. It's I think it's most important to have a partner that will talk you through the decisions so that you understand the the pros and cons of the decisions, the cost impact, you know, where we can cut corners, where we really shouldn't cut corners. You know, it's about a partnership and really working together to understand um, each of the steps. And I would say from an SEO perspective, Google does not care what content management system you use. They don't care what, if you're using Angular, JS, like, like it doesn't matter to them really. Again, it matters like, what are you trying to accomplish for their end users? And is it relevant to the queries that people are typing But it does matter when you're using a, a, a bloated platform because it's not yes, going yes, to yes. not it, that's going what to google cares well. about yes. but the name on yes. the box or the it name of the company right, like, I, I, like i assure you because some people think that like oh wix isn't seo friendly or it can't be seo friendly or this one is better and I, I i try not to get into those debates because one i don't think they're productive but two i don't really think at like an algorithmic level that's really like what google is even like looking at it's more like what are the outcomes of your choices and that's what you said you need someone yep. who can like guide you and give you good advice through a process that you may um, not be 100% familiar with. Um, Do we want to go to questions? Yeah, I just, you know, just quickly mentioning, you know, analytics. Uh, We had some more information to talk about on analytics. Um, But, you know, have a game plan in place of kind of like what is the actual type of data? What is going to help your business? What is going to actually help you achieve your goals versus just kind of relying on, oh, well, we have to have you know, everybody's going to have Google Analytics, but what you're looking at and how it's actually impacting your objectives is to actually put time and thought into that. Um, There's a lot of different technologies that you're going to be able to get as much information as you could possibly imagine 
not just from interaction on on site, but also personas, the the engagement, those types of things. So um, I know that was probably a lot of information, but what questions, uh, does anybody have any questions here? Uh, we can re we can repeat the question. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you ever have a client who is like um, needs to be convinced about the kind of like testing maintenance portion of design? You know, I mean, you mentioned like it's not like you serve it up on a platter and it's, right. not, <laughs> it's perfect, um, but you know, obviously that like second phase is like it's more ongoing. It's more of a question. How do you kind of like talk to? Okay, so just to re repeat back, the question is, um, do we have clients that question the what happens after launch, right? Right. What kind of support is needed? What kind of ongoing maintenance? Um, most of the websites we build here, we also host. So um, that, that starts the conversation as part of the hosting. We have an ongoing relationship. Uh, we build probably 85% of our websites at this point in WordPress. So um, making sure your WordPress sites is, are up to date, the core is up to date. If you've used any plugins, whatever plugins that they're up to date, otherwise it opens you up for hacking and that's never fun. Um, uh, you know, we do, as part of that package, uh, we offer backups, so pretty much if you do get hacked, we can just roll it back if anything happens to your site. We have multiple copies of it, like from any timestamp, and we can pretty much throw it right. The more um, the gray question is really comes to support, like what do you need? How how much many resources do you need to help support this website, right? Because we do want to be making sure it's it's working for your users and have some sort of a feedback loop on how well it's working. What kind of struggles are you seeing? Uh, what kind of enhancements do you want? You know, we built it, but but maybe there was you know you had dreams of much bigger. And, and the way that we build them, it's very easy to keep building it. Can, we can just keep build building onto it. Um, and what kind of support do you need there? Do you need support for uh, for ongoing testing? Do you need support for on content updates? It can it can be anything. So so that one's a little trickier because I think the website itself is a big investment, and then a lot of a lot of. Uh, Clients don't understand that it's an ongoing investment, and the more you give, the better it will be, and it will grow. And if you purchase any other software, it's you know you don't just buy it these days and they give it to you. You know there's there's ongoing support to it. So I think that's that's lagged more than anything. And now the majority of our clients have hosting maintenance and an ongoing support retainer of some sort in order to help maintain and build out and enhance the website and test and have some Yeah, it's part of an evolution of the business, yeah. or your, you know, the organization. Um, it's never, you know, a start stop situation, but, you know, definitely that mindset is, is there, but, um, you know, just from a technology standpoint, the things that are interacting with sites, such as like your, you know, uh, marketing automation software, review yeah. software, you know, moving into like chat and how all the different social messaging platforms are coming into the communication uh, ease uh, within sites. It's an ongoing thing. Like for most of the clients that we work with, just on the marketing technology side of things, we have to have ongoing conversations and, and work being done. But it's a really good question, you know, but we have faced that many times, you know, that type of thing. Did we answer it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> any any other, questions other questions from the live audience? Yes. I have two questions. The first one is SEO and the second one is design. For the SEO, you said that the keyword research was really important. Mm -hmm. So when you're working with the content writers, is it like the chicken and the egg? Like how much is it like you're doing the keyword research and then you report that to the content writers and then they write it and then you guys kind of have this like back and forth. Mm -hmm. So that's a question. Yeah. So one thing um, I try to avoid personally is just giving a spreadsheet to a copywriter. I, I did that in the past when I started my career and it never worked out super great. So what I do now is like I will spend a lot of time in my keyword research tool. I use one called SEMrush, but there's many out there you can use. But they generally, once you've kind of done your research, they'll 
export what you've learned in a spreadsheet, right? And it'll have the keyword and it'll have how many people search for it. If you're um, interested in like paid per click marketing, it'll give you an indicator of what the average cost per click is, etc. cetera. Um, at that point, what I do is I really, um, I, I do what I call tagging. And what I'm basically doing is I'm applying semantic labels to the keywords. So the keywords are just like I discover them and I kind of add them to my list, but they're not necessarily categorized or organized yet by like user intent. So when I have, whether it's a hundred or a thousand, and sometimes it's up to a thousand keywords, I will one by one, row by row, assign it a semantic category or label. And I'm really looking for like, I'll write a brief up. I'll like do the research and I'll do all the analysis in a spreadsheet. And then I'll write up a document for the copywriter called the keyword research brief. And it'll basically will break down um, at a page level or a site level. Typically I prefer to do it on a page level. Like we're going to write content for this page and the audience is this. And the purpose of the page is this, that we learned through the keyword research. And really what I want to give them is I want to make them aware of what are the things people search for and break it down in terms of adjectives, verbs, and nouns. Like I break it down like a grammar school teacher um, because the adjectives are the descriptive words. They want something that's um, maybe cheap, affordable, or maybe they want best luxury, right? Whatever that might be, it might be two complete ends of the spectrum. The descriptive words will be adjectives and adverbs. I always went back to like, people want to do something. What are the verbs, right? So I give the writers the verbs. Um, they want to sign up. They want to uh, like, you know, we have insurance clients compare, compare quotes, right? That's the main, one of the main activities in the insurance industry is just comparing quotes. So uh, what are the verbs? And then the nouns are probably the things that you do make or sell on the website, right? So if you really just kind of give the copywriters an indication of here are the most common adjectives, verbs, and nouns, and um, explore a little bit of like, again, I would say the user intent or psychology, if it's not immediately clear, sometimes the words make it very clear what the users are trying to do. But sometimes you might need a little bit more of, a, I would say, like a, a breakout or a, a elucidation of like, what is the, um, the reasoning or psychology behind that keyword group or cluster, as I call it. I, I like to call them clustering them by intent. Um, so I like to write documents that basically distill stuff you would get from spreadsheets and like make it clear and the language that copywriters that are more used to, that are not used to necessarily looking at things in rows and columns, um, they think of like words. So I, that's why I find that here are the verbs, adjectives, nouns, and everything else is basically just connecting words, right? You don't need like if, or, and, but, like those are just glue, they're, like, they're not core concepts. So can focus on the core concepts and give that to the copywriter. And then I let the copywriter write. I never try to micromanage copy. And then I ask to just see it as a review, like before you publish it. And then I give feedback. So yes, it is a collaborative process. Yeah, we don't. And it starts with like a brief. And then I let the copywriter write and just be creative and do what they do. Because again, sometimes I'm working with copywriters who are like, I write all the content on this site. So I have a particular voice or like we've determined from our brand guidelines that the voice is confident yet light, but reassuring, right? We, we create again, even for ourselves, a persona of how we want to come off. And an SEO is just going to, he's going to muddle that dish, right? It's, it's, he's going <coughs> to, he could give, be given all the right ingredients, but he's not going to get the recipe right the way that a copywriter would. So I really just try to let the copywriters write. And then again, this is why you work in dev sites, build that out in a sandbox. And then I can review them page by page go back to my keyword research. Do I feel that the intents have been properly spoken to? Do they align to what the page was supposed to be? If so, check, ready to publish. If there's any sort of things, then it becomes again, you know, like a conversation or a dialogue. Could we get more content or could you take this piece of content and maybe move it a little bit higher up in the copy? Everything's a negotiation. Everything's negotiable. <laughs> Things. But I think no, looking wanna, at quality right. content is important. Like we've seen sites where it's just like, they're just trying to rank. You know, and I think just touching on back to the brand, back to the actual voice, back to your actual messaging that you want to have quality content that's being developed and then working with like the technical side of SEO to work collaboratively. And, and there's lots of different ways that we've approached that. But to the second point of your question, um, you were talking on the visual side. Yeah. So, you know, with, you know, we talk about UI and UX, right? Like the mm -hmm. UI is kind of a small part, but there's so much... 
there's that's also always evolving, you know, like magic space, white space, you know, a lot of type that moves around, you make mm -hmm. making it like really beautifully designed websites that take forever to load, but they're like not really like user friendly or they don't really guide you, they're more like just beautiful pieces of art. So how do you A, how do you go out and get inspiration? How do you stay current? what the trends are for visual design right. for whether that's in typography and whatnot but and find a compromise of you know making them digestible or sometimes there's some clients that you can right. actually be really crazy because that's part of the brand right like mm -hmm. a museum sometimes you know yeah. so anyway that's more of a kind of like fun question yeah no i totally get it because um first of all we want to make the website usable and and when I hear the word trend, I kind of cringe sometimes because mm -hmm. it almost implies that it's something will not last, you know. So we, for most part, we want to create the websites that last long lasting um, experiences. So there are trends that are common that are usable and they've been tested and uh, they are really helping the user to navigate. Like, for example, the whole idea of the animated scrolls uh, that uh, has emerged past two years that actually help in the story when there is not limited amount of those to to move along to in an engagement engaging way but when for most part i want the website to to be trend free and to be digestible usable and clean and uh, those I, I, those larger websites with come with the brand brand guidelines and stuff like that. It's important too to find a way to uh, to incorporate that branding. And as far as those freedom websites, we have a lot of expressive uh, websites. Like for example, uh, those type of website would land land on those websites called awards. You know, with triple A in the name, awards or double uh, triple W in the name. Those are the type of websites you go to look just to look at something cool. Big agencies design them, and there there's a lot of tricks, you know, and mm -hmm. trends incorporated into those. But if you go there every other year, you notice that those trends are being dropped. So it's come almost like it's a playground for the designers to. Well, I guess I, I think of it as like you know your runway shows, right? Like right. You see in the runway, it's like really out there, very like not really right. who's gonna wear like. A Puppy, like, right. Know, plastic, exactly. Um, right. And, and they will and go then, away. Then it gets distilled down to like, okay, you know, then you know, a designer will take like, oh, well, the plastic, or mm -hmm. like, you know, the use of brown shapes, you know, and then it gets distilled down. So that's what I'm hearing from you. That yes, you still go out and you look at like stuff that is going to inspire you, but then you kind of distill it down to like, what are the really the elements? Of yeah, and you, I would always support that with the usability. Like I would go on the best practices, uh, look those up and see which of these particular elements of that trend will, you know, it's could remain if there is a user, if there is a testing done on those, you know, how user is engaging with those particular trends. And um, you can conduct these tests yourself as well and see how, how that, uh, behaves for your brand if it doesn't trends work. that endure yeah, become best right. practices it's an right. evolution right because yeah. uh, right we've all worked together this team has worked together for a long time and i see that and you talk about things moving in and out it makes me crazy like right uh -huh. <laughs> for no reason things are moving right. all over the place but but the little the little finesse here and there is really lovely right mm -hmm. and and can draw your eye when everything's moving it doesn't help so so going out seeing what people are doing but picking out what's actually helpful to the user right. and a little inspiring right and i see that in a lot of the things that merrick does um in the designs and how they've evolved over the years and the objective of the business yep. yeah you know i mean like you were talking about like we have a tyrannosaurus rex swimming in a lake animation on our website and the load time is probably not that awesome. It's not. I told and, you. And, and you know, you know, they'll say. And honestly, I don't care because it's because who doesn't like a tyrannosaurus? I ride? love the I love the tyrannosaurus. Or an elephant sitting, or an elephant sitting in a tree. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. I think, but so. but, the, but that's not going to fly for somebody who's trying to sell a product, mm -hmm. you know, or somebody that's trying to accomplish that business goal. And I I do think that when you're looking at the sites that you know, 
not looking at it as just a separate entity from your business objectives. And to really have clarity around those business objectives will help you find the right tone, the right path to go. And we improved I think we a are, lot of time on are. that dinosaur, I will also say. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like yeah. it was slower yeah. in dev when we tested mm -hmm. it. And you know, like I'm a big proponent, chain of notes, right. of uh, I always talk about Pareto, Pareto's law. You get 80% of the returns from basically your first, often 20% if you think about it strategically, 20% of the efforts. So we got our 80% of the gains. And then it was like, is it worth squeezing more and more milliseconds at a time? And it wasn't. We had other bigger fish to fry that day. So again, compromise. Everything's it's negotiable. Everything's in negotiation. <laughs> so um, what other? Any, yeah, do, yeah. Do you have any questions? other questions? Yes. Yes. Forgive me. Very naive questions. It's all super new to me. But how often do you do situations come up where somebody, you know, reaches out and says, "I, I need an SEO strategy," and, and you're looking at it and you're thinking. Mm, this seems more maybe a design or you know issue and vice versa. Like how how much do those two things shape each other? It seems to me like it's quite a bit. And I'm just curious is the perception of, of a potential client or somebody who might think that their problem is one and not the other or maybe both. All the time. I mean that one hand washes the other. Yeah. So it's 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 a very cohesive type of thing. But you know, I think for for us you know, looking out for the client's best interest. Most of the people that we're working with are either in business or they're trying to get new employees or they're, they're, they, there's an objective at hand. Um, and we know how critical search is and, and being found is. So, you know, I think we try to direct our clients into always kind of either you know, getting a, a, a SEO strategy mapped out previously or doing an audit on the site, you know, and I think that that really helps guide, you know, not just the SEO, but it also kind of is cohesive into how we're going to develop a site or how we're going to design a site or what type of pages this site needs. So, um, Yes, they they watch. I hope I'm answering your question, yeah. but I think it's critical from what we've seen to always have some sort of SEO strategy and SEO knowledge uh, in your in your tool belt when you're moving forward and building, or even you know just recreating a site. We actually like to do audits every you know year or so. Yeah. Um, you know because trends change, things change. You know we didn't get into like localized you know, SEO today, uh, cause we're talking about websites, but that's a whole, you know, thing amongst itself. But, um, I think one hand washes the other and it needs to be a cohesive approach. Any other questions? Cause we're kind of out of time, but oh. yeah, no, it's you okay. Can, we'll answer we're, we're questions. No, nobody's throwing us out. So, <laughs> you know. Um, I have a question about SEO, SEO and social media. Like how do you kind of like balance that? Cause it's mm -hmm. changed yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so like I'll try to give a really brief answer on this one. For years, Google and all the Silicon Valley companies were playing walled garden. Like Apple's still pretty kind of trying to do walled garden, but even now they're breaking down their walls. But for a long time, Google is almost like you didn't really find Facebook content in there. Twitter was always a little bit more like indexable and stuff, and you might find like Twitter stuff in, in, in Google search results. But now Google, you've seen... Um, now it's all Reddit. Yeah. <laughs> It's one, yes. It's all it's, Reddit. It's all Reddit results. <laughs> They've partnered now with Reddit. Um, that was one of the recent topics in our most recent SEO brief, Google partnering with Reddit. Um, but they, Google has definitely opened up, I would say, a little bit of the walls and is trying to um, index more content. You definitely see with Reddit, TikTok and videos. Um, Google still is very, uh, you have seen the, the pivot on YouTube to Reels right? Or the shorts, it's Facebook reels, YouTube shorts, all trying to compete with TikTok, mm -hmm. right? But you can kind of all find all three of them now, particularly if you're looking specifically for video results or whatever you're searching for, because Google now like mixes and matches their search results. There's so many different types of results, even in like one basic search. You'll get 
links to websites, like what Google used to be, 10 blue links. That's what it was known for, right? Just links to websites. But there wasn't necessarily a thing in the search result. Now they're embedding videos or thumbnails, knowledge boxes, map packs for local results, all sorts of like richer features, right? Snippets, whatever you want to call them. So I would say the, the Google has definitely one, made an effort to actually index or return social results. So it makes more sense, like, you know, because before it's like, well, social just does what social does. It has nothing to do with what I do. Now I would say like, well, if content is the fuel that feeds the SEO machine, right, content is a natural place to go and get a lot of that content from. You don't need your website anymore to be your primary vector or dissemination point of your content. It could be a channel through which, other stuff that you have on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, or maybe you're on Pinterest, whatever community might be, the website can become like part of it, like a hub and spoke model. Um, and definitely if you're doing good, good social content, um, you will find no shortage of it if it's relevant to particular search, search yeah. results. So if it makes now, sense say video, for you as a you know, company, yeah. you know, if it, it, makes it sense. should be part of that. Yeah, I, strategy, I just two I quick things well. to add to that. I think that like using social media to like drive more content engagement is very helpful from an SEO standpoint. And two, we're starting to see like going back to the localized SEO side of things. We kind of look at Google, My, if you're familiar with like Google My Business pages, um, that that's almost like a social platform that helps ranking with like within uh, return results for the pack, right? So I, I think looking at those types of things and how those things yeah, again. Yeah, Google really likes its own strategy. Products, so. <laughs> yeah, that, you know. <laughs> yeah, and they dip their hands into a lot of different waters these days. Um, so. Yeah, definitely. If your content strategy lends itself naturally to video or to social, I would say definitely do it just even to do it on those channels. But you don't have to be fearful that it won't surface in search and that they won't like have a natural intersection or dovetail because that used to be a thing where it was walled off, but it's not anymore. Okay. Well, Any other final yeah, questions? We, yeah, we, we yeah. actually are way over time. So um, <laughs> All right. thank you, everybody, for actually showing up in person. Yeah, thank and thank you. you to the virtual audience. We yeah. hope this was a helpful experience. We hope we you've gotten some good information. We are here if you uh, would like to talk about any web-related products, but it is a very exciting time uh, for web uh, in 2024, and it's going to be an exciting few years coming up with everything that AI and all the new tools and tactics that are out there. So thank you very much, and we hope you guys have a great yep. day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.